always. And again, I say rejoice. You can kind of feel the quiet in the air, can't you? The, the lack of tension in the air. And it's so much so that this week, even when I was preparing the message, I thought I'd have a little fun with my sermon research. So I did a little Facebook question, and I asked, what are the top three occasions when you would buy new clothes? Now, I was pretty surprised. I had 67, over 67 people respond, and 40% of those responding were men. So I thought that was a little surprising, too. And some of you ladies just laughed, thinking, yeah, they don't ever shop. You know? uh, well, here's what I found out. Uh, coming in at number 10, and we'll work our way up to the number one thing, number one reason people buy clothes. And on your uh, handouts, I've listed the top three that you can fill in the blanks. But number 10 was, it's my birthday. I'm going to buy clothes. And that tied with, it's our anniversary. I think I need a new outfit. Number nine was a four-way tie. Going to the beach. Mardi Gras, one boat, <laughs> a reunion, or going hunting. Now, I wish Danny was here, because I'd be going, Danny, what kind of clothes do you need to go hunting in? But then I thought about when me and Miles used to go dirt bike riding, and man, we had all the, you know, the special gear, the special boots, you know, and you had to deck it out. So whatever outside sport there is, you've got to have the right clothes for it. Uh, number eight, to go on a date. For some of us, it's been a long time since we went on a date with anyone but our lovely bride. But that's every Saturday morning at the Huddle House, you know. Yeah, you know, can't do evening days. Bedtime's 7 o'clock. You can't do a movie or anything like that. Uh, also tied for number eight reason to buy new outfits was a weight change. Now, in this thing, everybody said, I lost weight. Now, let's get real. The last time I bought new pants is because I needed to go up two sizes with stretchy waistline, you know? That's then the work pants. I said, okay, let's, let's get real with it. How many other people here have got in the back of their closet skinny pants? You got your skinny jeans at home. If you got skinny jeans in the, in the back of the closet, you know one day I'm going to wear those again. One day. One day hadn't got here yet, but I keep hanging on to them. Half my closet is skinny jeans. Mm. Let's see, number uh, seven, might buy a new outfit to go to a graduation or to some kind of party. Number six, Christmas. I thought Christmas would rank higher, but number six, or a family portrait tied, tied with Christmas. Vacation, number five. Number four, a business event, whether it's a job interview or a Christmas party, something like that. And then we got the top three. Any guesses for the top three? Let me hear it. Oh, and what else? Wedding and funeral. funeral and okay. Everyone who came to the early service cannot answer this. <laughs> yes, number three was Easter, which I thought would be number one. Number two was a funeral. I've never thought about buying a new suit to go to a funeral, but the number one reason someone might buy new clothes was to go to a wedding. To go to a wedding had fourteen more votes than second place. It makes a lot of sense, though, if we think about what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22. He tells the parable of a king who threw a wedding party. King threw a feast because his son, the prince, was getting married. He sends out the invitations to all the A-list people, all those upper crust people, you know, the, the ones that are your friends, the ones that you got to uh, impress, you know, because I'm going to throw this big kingly shebang. And nobody came from the A-list invitations. The king was furious. I'm not going to tell you what he did after that, but skipping on down just a little bit, we're going to see that he, went, he sent out new invitations to the B-list crowd. The B-list invitations went out, and here's what the scripture says about the B-list invitations. The Bible says both good and bad were invited. It doesn't go into detail. What are the good and the bad? Who are the good and the bad people? So I had to imagine what it might be. In my mind, maybe it was the homeless and the harlots. Maybe it was the felons and the freeloaders in that group. And I imagine the Beatles people would have jumped at the chance to go to a wedding at the castle, at the king's place, the wedding for a prince, and we've been invited. But it happened that Jesus says in verse 11, when the king came in and took a look at the guest, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. And the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, tie him up, throw him out, cast him out into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
for many are called and few are chosen. That's a pretty stiff penalty for being underdressed. We don't know why the man wasn't wearing wedding clothes. Did he not have anything nice? Was he too poor to buy new clothes? Regardless of why, the man chose to go to the party underdressed. Have you ever been somewhere and realized you were underdressed? Write it down if you're at home. Write it in there. Where were you? Here, where did you go and you felt underdressed? The, a restaurant. Oh, turned out to be a cloth napkin place. Oh, Rebecca, <laughs> we did that one time. Rebecca and I went to the Village Tavern. Tavern, it's got to be just, you know, eh, whatever. No, this was a tavern with cloth, you know. And we had just been to Oak Mountain State Park. We were sweaty. It was summer. We'd been in the paddle boats. I mean, we both wanted to turn around and leave. But guess what? The guy says, come on in, come on in. It was 3 in the afternoon. There was nobody there, so we slipped on in. Good food, too. How about another place you've been underdressed? Oh, you guys got it all together, I see. Well, I want to confess, there was another time I was underdressed. It was, uh, I went to a funeral. Now, I was not officiating. It wasn't a Lutheran funeral. It was given by another denomination. Another pastor was officiating. And I walked in with a nice button-down shirt, had my slacks on, polished my shoes. I thought I was looking pretty good. Guess what? Every other man in that place had on a suit and tie. I felt horribly underdressed. I have never been to a funeral again without a suit and tie on. Sometimes, though, we, we put too much emphasis on, on clothes. Sometimes we do. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was one time when I was inviting a guy to come to church here at Good Shepherd. I really wanted him to come. And I didn't pressure him, but every once in a while, I'd see him. and Oh, hey, man, how's it going? Hey, why don't you come visit with us? And, you know, I'd, do that. I'd see him once or twice a month, you know, and invite him. Finally, I just got too curious for why he wouldn't. And so I asked him. What is it exactly? You know, share with me. Why won't you come visit Good Shepherd? Won't you come? You know, I'm thinking maybe he doesn't know what Lutherans are. I, mean, I don't know what his, his thing is. He says, "Well, Pastor Ed, I just don't have the right clothes." I said, "It's okay. It's okay. We're we're a pretty casual bunch. We believe it's what's in your heart, not what's on your back. So, won't you come visit with us? I, I just can't do it. I can't do it without the right clothes on." Well, I knew that there were some generous people here in the congregation, so I talked to one of our members. And I put them together with this gentleman, and they went out and bought him a new suit, new shoes, new shirt, bought him a new tie, and had him dressed up. And so I was ready and eager to see him walk in that Sunday, because I'd been inviting him for a while. Well, that Sunday came, and he didn't show. He did not come. And so I was like, what, what is going on? What excuse can he have now? So I'll tell you what I did. That evening, after we went out to eat, I, I went to his door, you know, because I knew where he was. Hey. You know, what's going on, man? I, I, just, I really expected you to see you there today after we got you a new suit of clothes. Well, Pastor Ed, it's like this. I put on the suit, and I put on the tie, and I put on all the new clothes. And I look so good, I decided to go to Baptist church. <laughs> now, I'm just kidding. That didn't really happen. <laughs> However, sometimes we put a little too much emphasis on clothes. But as Americans, we've gotten away from dressing up, haven't we? We've gotten away from, in the movie Downton Abbey, which was set in 1927, they would dress for dinner. Anybody here watch Downton Abbey? Anybody at home watch Downton Abbey? My wife got me turned on to the show. I love it. It's a fun show to watch. But I tell you what, I think dressing for dinner is a bit much. I'm not putting on a tie to go eat fried bologna. That's all there is to it. But there are times when we should wear better clothes, right? The Bible continually talks of the wedding as a place to get decked out. In the Song of Solomon, 311. Go out, daughters of Zion, look upon the King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart. The first recorded miracle of Jesus was where? At a wedding in Cana of Galilee in John 2. In the Gospels, you'll find that Jesus will repeatedly call himself the bridegroom and the church his bride. That means that we who believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we who follow Christ, are the bride of Christ. And we've been invited to a wedding feast that will last forever in heaven. You cannot say you don't have anything to wear. I can't say I don't have anything to wear because in our lesson today, the prophet Isaiah says, God the Father will give us our wedding clothes. First verse. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me. He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. 
He's covered me with the robe of righteousness. As the bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. I mean, you know, really and truly, though, have you ever seen anybody look any better than at their own wedding? I mean, oh. I've got seven pictures of you guys that I want to put up on the screen of your weddings that I got off faith. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't do that. <laughs> but it would have been fun. <laughs> When God invites you to a party, not only does he let you know the dress code, because don't we ask that? How should I, what should I wear? What, how should I dress for this party? You know, is it casual? Is it formal? Is it, is it tux? Because I'm not going if it is. <laughs> God provides the tuxedo. God provides the evening gown. The garments of salvation and the robe of righteousness. That's what the Christmas gift is. Clothes. As a child, how many here would love to open a box at Christmas and go, clothes, socks, sweater? Whoa, man, we didn't want clothes. Most children don't. But without the robe of righteousness, you cannot enter the pearly gates. You cannot go to heaven without the robe of righteousness that God gives us. If we did we try to, we'd be like the man that the king caught without the wedding clothes on. And what would happen was he'd say, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness in that place of weeping and gnashing of teeth but god sent our christmas gift in some very unique wrapping paper our christmas gift those clothes were wrapped in a manger and a cross and an empty tomb that's how our forgiveness came wrapped Jesus Christ laid that gift before us on that first Christmas day. The Holy Spirit then took that word and created faith in our heart, and we received the garment of salvation through the power of the Spirit. There's comfort in knowing that God not only calls us, He dresses us for eternity. So how does He do that? How, how does God clothe us with the garments of salvation? How do we receive this heavenly gift? And I found some things in Scripture that I thought were relevant to this. Number one, we, we, we need to hear. You need to open your ears and listen to what God is saying. Jesus said this, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. St. Paul writes, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It's God the Holy Spirit who creates faith. If, if faith is created by the word of God, that means that we need to be somewhere to hear the word of God. Everybody in here better say amen. And we need to be somewhere to hear the Word of God. Open it at home, hear it preached, tune in if you can't make it. And if there's a uh, coronavirus, you know, some, we can hear the Word of God. There's still ways to hear the Word of God. Number two, we need to believe what we hear. Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Believe that he sent me, Jesus said. Believe in the one the Father has sent to bring us new life. And to make us a new creation. One of my favorite verses in scripture is that we are a new creation. Sometimes we act like the old guy, but we're still we're brand new creations. Number three, we need to repent. God the Holy Spirit works in our heart to bring about a godly sorrow. You ever done somebody wrong and you knew it? You ever done something wrong and you knew it? And you never felt bad about it? That's dangerous. That, that really is a dangerous situation. That means your, your spirit's getting, getting calloused. But see, repentance comes when God pricks your heart and makes you have that godly sorrow. Repentance is nothing more than realizing you've sinned against God and other people and being heartbroken about it. Number four, then, there's a time to confess. St. Paul writes in Romans 10, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And we need... Baptism. See, baptism ties it all together. Galatians 3.27 says this, For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Jesus Christ. In baptism, God gives us our Jesus suit. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Not always in that order. The Bible says that in baptism we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we might be baptized as an infant. And then hear, and then believe, and then confess, and then repent. 
It happens many ways. You look at Scripture, and there's a lot of different ways that people came to faith in the New Testament. So Paul writes that in response to the garments of salvation, in response to be adopted into the family of God, in response to being dressed for the wedding feast in a robe of righteousness, there's also a few articles of clothing that we need to add to the forgiveness that Christ won for us. But wait a minute. Wait a minute, preacher. The Bible says we don't need anything else but Jesus. We don't need anything else to, but salvation. Once I'm forgiven, I'm good to go, right? Well, for heaven's purposes, yeah, maybe you're good to go. You know, maybe forgiveness is all you want and all you need. But Paul said, what about living here on this earth? There's some things we need to dress in to live here on this earth that might make things go a little bit better. Paul's words in Colossians 3 are like this. If I officiated your wedding, you've heard these verses. Because I like to use these verses in weddings. Uh, it wasn't specifically written for a wedding. It was written to the people of Colossae saying, this is how godly people live together. But it fits so well for a wedding, I thought. Colossians 3, 12 to 15. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves, he says. Paul says, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Isn't that perfect for a wedding? I just think it's great verses. First it says, clothe yourselves with compassion. See, compassion is an inner attitude. Compassion is the difference between seeing a bum on the road who's begging for money and going, get a job, you bum, and going, wonder what happened to this guy. Wonder how I can help. How can I pick him up? How can I, can I help out? Compassion is seeing someone that comes to our food pantry month after month after month and going, how can we lift them up and get them out of the situation and put them in a better situation? Where a lack of compassion may be going, here they are again. They're just not doing anything. They're just lazy vagrants. Compassion is an attitude that Christ wants us to have. It's how you treat other people privately and in public. Another thing we need to put on, another article of clothing, is kindness. When you're clothed with kindness, you're trying to do what's best for other people, not just yourself. Kindness is a garment that has healing in its wings. Uh, I read a story, oh, I saw a story on the news this week about a kindness. Have you ever, ever seen the book, uh, Random Acts of Kindness? I mean, somebody had to write a book to tell half Christians how to be kind. <laughs> but it's, it's a good book if you want to be intentional about it. So my question then is this, has anyone here ever had, you're in the drive-thru at whatever your favorite restaurant, you pull up to the window and go, the car ahead of you paid for it. Has that ever happened to anybody? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven people here. How about at home? Say, me? Me? Have you happened to you at home? Somebody bought this? Well, in the news this week, and they're trying to put on good news, because how much of the news is good? <laughs> not much. Jim gave a raspberry for that one. <laughs> not much of the news is good, you know. But they have a section that's good news. And so somebody pulled up at the drive thru and they said, The car in front of you bought your meal. Oh, well, I'll buy the meal for the car behind me. That car pulled up. Guess what? Wow, really? Somebody bought my meal? I'll call. I'll buy for the car behind me. 200 cars in a row, people bought meals for the car behind them. I've never heard of such a thing. And just spontaneous. Nobody plans that kind of an act of kindness. It just happened. 200 people in a row. Now, don't feel bad if you just accepted it and didn't you know, pass it on to the person behind you. That was not the point of the story, okay? But just this, this a random thing like that to happen is wrong. There's another item of clothing Christians need to put on. If you truly are a follower of Christ, you need humility. Scripture says, consider other people better than yourself. In every arena of life, in marriage, in work, in church, in families, there's a place where pride and the need to be right takes over. A struggle for power occurs. A lack of humility leads to all kinds of struggles. But humility recognizes that other people are equal to me. They have an equal status and their ideas are equal. Gentleness is another one, another wonderful garment for a follower of Christ. Gentleness is, an, is, a, is a, a sign of a God-controlled person. You ever had somebody talk about, boy, they're not, they haven't got much self-control. 
every time I sit down at Thanksgiving dinner, I have very little self-control. But this is not the kind of control we're talking about. We're talking about God-controlled person. Someone who God is guiding them to speak, act in a way that they wouldn't want to. In a way, when they've been disrespected, they want to say something. They want to have that right jab to come back with. But a God-controlled person doesn't do it. They think it, but doesn't say it. That's gentleness. Tell you what, when you put on gentleness, when you put on a jacket or sweater of gentleness, then your fellow church member, when, when you put on gentleness, your coworker, when you put on gentleness, your spouse can take off their armor of defensiveness and put on trust. They can put on trust when you're gentle. Every relationship in life could use several garments of gentleness. Now, here's one that's absolutely necessary, and no one claims to have it down pat. Patience. Patience. There's a country song that says, God is great, beer is good, and people are crazy. Everybody here has at least one person in their life. Don't write their name on the screen at home, okay? You have one person in your life, at least, that's crazy. They're an EGR person. What's an EGR person? Extra grace required. I've got to be able to dish out more grace when I'm around this person because they just tax me to the end, to no limits. They're an EGR. And we need patience for that. Friendships take patience. Marriage takes patience. Church people take patience with each other. Patience requires a spirit of live and let live. One more essential, a spirit of forgiveness. There's a lot that needs to be forgiven if you're dealing with people. I need to be forgiven by some of you. Maybe I need to forgive you or someone else that I know. A spirit of forgiveness is a, is a coat that needs to be put on daily. It's a sign of spiritual maturity when you're willing to say, I'm sorry. And you don't just say it to end the fight. You don't just say it to get out of a tight spot. You say it because a friendship is more important than being right. Come to think of it, I don't know of anyone who's right all the time. Sometimes we are actually wrong and need to say, I'm sorry. Paul says, forgive as Christ forgave you. St. Paul was a prolific writer and teacher of how to live a Christ-centered life. He said, once you've put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and forgiveness, don't leave off the most important thing, the top hat. The top hat of the Christian clothing, it says, on top of all these things, put on love. The clothes that Paul invites you to put on are not natural. They're spiritually woven. You just can't sometimes forgive without the power of Christ helping you without the Holy Spirit working through faith in Christ to create these things. And Paul ends with this. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. If you can put on all these garments daily, I think the peace of Christ will rule in your heart. So I want to end with this. A quote that I found. I don't know who it's by. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent an economist. But our greatest need was forgiveness. So God sent a Savior. Amen. I invite you to rise and let's prepare to go to the Lord in prayer and then sing a song of praise. Heavenly Father, we thank you for time together in your word. Continue to lead us, guide us, and forgive us in Christ's holy name.